Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. We're cruising right along on this crash course that's taken way longer than I thought, but I underestimated when you're trying to explain this story to people who don't know everything about it, how long it takes, but we'll get there. Promise you guys. Y'all seem to be enjoying it, so it's all good. Big thank you to Amy, Nancy, and Ronnie for your donations. Appreciate you guys so much. Music fact of the day, the song of the gambler. Written by Don Schlitz and performed by the late, great Kenny Rogers, says the song isn't really about a card game. It's about handling what life gives you, as some would call it, playing the hand you're dealt. And the good thing about music, and one of my favorite things, is you can tell me what it was written about all day, but I'm always going to see two dudes on a train playing a card game. So there you go. All right, we're jumping right back in. So we're on July 19th now. That's eight days after Charles was murdered. At 12.53 p.m., Chad sends Lori a message providing trust levels of those she needed to trust and those she needed to be aware of. We've talked about this on past episodes. And so the list was as follows. We know Audrey is a 100. She is the person that I told you about a couple of days ago who Lori texted inside that Walgreens also meets up with her later in the year in October in Missouri when they're seeing the sites that are important to the LDS church and Raphael, which is another name for Chad. They got 100s. Melanie Gibb got a 97. Melanie got an 85. Zulema got a 96. Al, Alex got a 94. Summer, her sister got a 40. Her mom, Janice, a 15. Her dad, Barry, got an 8. And her brother, Adam, 0. So the same day at 5.41 p.m., Melanie texted Lori. It's Melanie Lee, my clear line. I'll use it for emergencies. If you have something you want to send to this phone, text me a, and she has a little monkey emoji, and I'll know to look in this one. July 20th, that's the day Lori buys Chad that plane ticket from Provo, Utah to Arizona with that same credit card she used to pay for Charles's cremation just days earlier. On July 21st, Melanie sends Lori a message. You should get a life insurance policy on JJ, Tylee, and you. Because after Charles, we see that anything can always happen. It's in the Lord's will. July 22nd. Chad texts Lori, there are only 272 threes left and none of them have occupied a body before. They are down to their last reserves. I'm glad I caught Elroy. I feel he was aiming to hide out and then get into JJ. So I'm assuming the 272 number are level three demons. And here we go. July 22nd is the first mention of something with JJ. Lori says, good morning. She puts a little sunshine emoji. Missing you. Didn't sleep much. Need you to check JJ. Weird stuff happened in the middle of the night. It's like they distracted us with Blake. And she puts ellipse emoji. Some of these names have never been clarified. I assume they're just these made up entities that they obsess over. Then Lori says, just dropped off. JJ cleared the school and placed him in a shield of protection. And she puts a lips emoji. So between July 22nd and the 26th, there's a few things going on. Lori goes to JJ's school and tells them that Charles killed himself and JJ didn't know. The staff thought that was strange. And so they Googled Charles Vallow and learned he was killed in a family altercation. The staff member said JJ had days where he was sad and distressed and told his teacher, quote, my dad's not in heaven. He is traveling, end quote. Oh, man, that breaks your heart. And, you know, it's important to point out that in Lori's mind, she had told people JJ wouldn't understand what happened to Charles. This right here goes to show you JJ understood. She lessened his capabilities, I think. And in doing that, I think she tried to make herself look like a saint for being his adopted mom. Now, Kay Woodcock tells Detective Moffat that Lori texted saying they were moving back to Hawaii ASAP. 
in that text, Lori says JJ won't be able to come to Louisiana for his father's funeral and ask Hey, which address she wants Charles's ashes sent to and a box of things for Charles's sons. It should be mentioned that one of Charles's sons gave an interview where he said they got a couple of Timex watches you could have bought at a CVS to where Charles always wore very expensive watches, nice watches, and they're pretty certain she sold everything off. So July 22nd, Lori emails the dog training company saying they need to find another home for JJ's service dog, Bailey, due to a change in life circumstances. And that that is so low. This dog was very beneficial to JJ. In fact, I believe Lori's sister Summer minimized in an interview about Bailey saying that JJ didn't care for the dog. But I'm going to tell you right now, JJ loved that dog. It's apparent. Look at little Bailey standing guard over his buddy. And but Lori has no soul, clearly. July 23rd, in an email to investigators, one of Charles' sons wants an order of protection because they feel unsafe. Totally get why they would feel unsafe. He also asks about Alex being able to legally carry a weapon. Now, Detective Moffat explains that since Alex completed his terms of probation, the charge was reduced to a misdemeanor and therefore he was able to carry a gun. He also said there was no probable cause to arrest anyone at that point. So any of them can travel wherever they want to. They are waiting on the cell phone records. However, in an email from the FBI to Chandler, Arizona investigators in December. Now, let's just put this out there. This is eight days before Alex Cox drops over dead. It is said his record had not been expunged. So he was still a prohibited possessor. Why did they not go pick him up right then? What would have been different if they had have picked him up? Because, spoiler alert, Alex Cox drops over dead the day after they exhumed Tammy Daybell's body, Chad's wife, who was murdered. And now he is facing charges for her murder. Lori is facing conspiracy to commit murder for her. Now, I they say it was natural. It was blood clots to the lungs. You'll never convince me of that. Way too convenient. But the same day, Kay receives a text from Lori. It said, "Lo, y'all okay? I'm worried. Please just send a quick text that y'all are okay. Did you see flight itineraries? Are you good with it? Love you. Kisses for JJ from me and Papa. Lori responds the next day at 125. Sorry, yes, we are okay. Been busy. I've never received any email from you. We've been figuring out what to do. JJ won't be able to go to Louisiana next week. We're moving back to Hawaii ASAP before school starts there. Please send me the address that you want me to send the ashes to for your memorial. I'll also send a box of things for Charles's sons. If you could give it to them, that would be great. Thanks. Kay responds, is there any way possible I can get him? I can be there tomorrow since he's out of school. Once you're settled in Hawaii, I will bring him to you there. It breaks my heart he won't be able to attend the service. Us keeping him while you move will help you. It's a win-win situation. I had rethought flight plans after I booked. Since you said he's out of school tomorrow, from tomorrow until August 5th, I wanted to change and get him tomorrow anyway, but you didn't reply to my text. Please let me know. However we can work this out, we will bend over backwards to work around your schedule. I need JJ hugs and kisses very badly right now. Everyone is looking forward to seeing him. Please, low, and she puts a bunch of prayer hand emojis. Lori responds, once we are settled there, you are welcome to come visit him. It's just too confusing for him right now. He won't know what's going on at the memorial. It's better this way. Send me the address and I'll have him FaceTime you tonight. So Kay emails Detective Moffat and says it's devastating them. And I guess she won't let him come because she's afraid that we will keep him. We can't legally, and we are law-abiding citizens. She asks, what does this do to the investigation as far as Lori saying they're moving to Hawaii, which never was in her plans. This was a lie to probably throw Kay off to Idaho, where they ended up. So Detective Moffat responds, the only downside to her moving is she won't be readily available to interview in person. He says if they were able to establish probable cause to arrest her, he would obtain a warrant and have her extradited to Arizona. He said it's not difficult since Lori is still in the United States. 
And he also asked if Lori worked while they lived in Hawaii when Charles and Tylee and JJ lived there. And Kay was like, nah, she didn't work. So July 25th, let's see, July 26th at 8.13 p.m., another message from this Bubby number, which is Chad, and it's Chatty Potter. I call it Chatty Potter. He says, tonight I figured out who I feel like. I'm a grown-up version of Harry Potter who has to live with, and he says the Dudleys. It's the Dursleys, you idiot. In his little space under the stairs, every few weeks I get to escape and have amazing adventures with my goddess lover. But then I have to return to my place under the stairs feeling trapped. But I sense permanent freedom is coming. Oh, man. what <laughs> Y'all. Chatty Potter. Dumble dumb. I could go all day. So I'm just going to move on. So July 29th, Kay sends some messages to Detective Moffat where Lori realizes she is not the beneficiary of Charles's $1 million life insurance policy. Kay said she would dance with the devil for JJ's sake. And then she says, I pretty much am when conversing with her. In the text, Lori says five kids and no money and his sister gets everything. This is the last text, by the way, that Kay gets from Lori. That money was designated for JJ. And Charles said that in emails. We didn't go that deep into it. But Charles knew that if something happened to him, he assumed Kay would be the one to take care of JJ for the rest of his life. And Charles knew that JJ may not ever be independent on his own living. So that money was meant to take care of JJ well into the future. On July 30th, Chad sent Lori a message that read, Tammy is at a three. JJ is at a two. Both are being heavily shielded to stop intruders. Now, these are death percentages, by the way. July 30th, there is a text from Chad who's listed as Bubby again. And he says, yes, we might need to release a little steam when we talk to fire emojis. He says, anyway, this is the chart that checks what percentage mortals are still in their body. It worked for my friend's wife who died, my neighbor, George Bush, Stanley, etc. I kind of forgot about it because we've been dealing with zombies and demonic entities. But this afternoon, Tammy said she felt lightheaded as if her body and spirit weren't connected. So July 30th, less than a month after Charles, now they're talking about Tammy and J.J., potentially being taken over by demons. In another text, he said, I got the inspiration to go back to my original death percentages that helped us track Charles, Ned, etc. Tammy is very close. Her percentage has fallen steadily since Iplos left. It is encouraging. And he puts a heart and lips emoji. Our next partner is Athletic Greens. I take AG1 by Athletic Greens literally every day. I gave AG1 a try because I'm always busy and my diet isn't the best, but I still want to get all the vitamins my body needs without taking a ton of pills. I take AG1 in the morning before my first cup of coffee and it makes me feel ready to take on my day. Why take a bunch of different things when you can just mix one scoop of powder in water once a day? It's the healthiest thing you can do in under a minute. With one scoop, I'm getting 75 vitamins and minerals that help my mood, energy levels, and healthier hair, skin, and nails. It's delivered to me every month, and it's been the easiest way to arm my body with everything it needs to tackle my day. If you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash what the world. That's athleticgreens.com slash what the world. Check it out. You know your girl's been lacking in the sleep department lately, but I found something that helps me sleep much better when I do sleep. Who knew that a better pillowcase is all you need for better sleep? Let's talk about practicing self-care while you sleep. Set yourself up with better sleep this year with Blissey's award-winning 100% Mulberry Silk Pillowcases. It gives you better hair and skin. Seriously, silk, it's what's best for your hair and skin. It reduces frizz, tangles, and prevents breakage. That's because it keeps the moisture in your hair and your skincare products and natural moisture on your skin, unlike cotton does. You can say goodbye to wrinkly, dry, flaky skin in the morning and wake up with healthier and shinier hair that won't take you an hour to fix. Blissey's pillowcase regulates temperatures, keeping you cool at night. 
you don't have to flip the pillow anymore. Thank goodness. Unlike other silk pillowcases, these are the highest quality silk. And guess what? They're machine washable and durable. Valentine's Day is coming up, so why not give the gift a better sleep? Plus, it comes in gift-ready packaging they'll be sure to love. I love that the pillow stays cool, I don't have to flip it, and no more sleep lines. Everybody loves them. They have a ton of different prints and colors, and they make great gifts because there's an option for literally anyone. Hey, men, they love them too. They have over 1 million raving fans, and you need to be next. Try now, risk-free, for 60 nights at blissy.com slash whattheworld. Get an additional 30% off. That's blissy, B-L-I-S-S-Y dot com slash whattheworld. And use code whattheworld to get 30% off. Your skin and your hair will thank you. August 2nd. Chad is in town in Arizona. Now, this is for a gathering in the same house where Charles was murdered. Melanie Gibb organized this. She sent out an email for people to come hear her then boyfriend, David Warwick, speak. Now, if you're on YouTube and you look to the left, you're going to see a little heart connecting Melanie Gibb and David Warwick. They were boyfriend, girlfriend, got married. Not sure if they're still married. I've heard maybe not. So who knows? Now, Zulema said this was the first time she saw Lori and Chad being romantic together. Now, remember, Tammy is still alive at this point. This meeting is when, according to Z Zulema, they talk about moving to Rexburg for the first time. August 3rd, M Melanie texts Alex and says, it's Leilani Lee. Save my number for you guys only. The contact was saved on the phone as Miriam. I get so confused with all these names, y'all. I'd be calling everybody something that, I mean, Miriam, Leilani, good grief. Charles' celebration of life takes place also August 3rd at the Lake Charles Civic Center, and we know Lori and JJ were not there. Sometime in August, uh, Kay and Larry contacted the school where JJ was attending and said they hadn't been able to see JJ and wanted to know if he was okay course the school was limited on what they could share because of restrictions and privacy laws also sometime in august highly unenrolls from school in arizona now what's interesting to me is i thought she had her ged so why is she un unenrolling in school melanie gibb told east idaho news and dateline these are kind of combined interviews that Lori didn't decide until august that she was going to move to idaho because at first she thought chad would come to arizona to be with her and then she said, I changed my plans. I'm supposed to be up there. He says I'm supposed to be up there, but I need to get my own answer. According to Melanie Gibb, Lori really did not want to go at first. And then she said, I was told, yes, I need to go. And she needed to be there by a certain time. So she decided to go. I'm like, isn't that going to be awkward? Talking about with Tammy still being alive. And Lori was uncomfortable with it. She believed that Tammy was going to pass away, though, before she got up there. And that didn't happen. Melanie Gibbs like, well, maybe she'll see you guys together or something. And Nate Eaton asked, well, how is Tammy going to die? Nate Eaton with East Idaho News, by the way. Melanie Gibbs said, I heard a few times, maybe through a car accident, something like that. Now, on Dateline, Melanie Gibbs said she gave other people a story that she was going to get a job there. But we both knew it wasn't about a job. It was about her connecting with Chad and living up there and being part of their mission. They didn't want anybody to stop them from being together. On August 5th, that was JJ's first day of school in Arizona. August 7th, Melanie Gibbs' divorce is final from her first husband, although she's invited people to come watch her boyfriend, you know, do all that. August 8th, this photo of JJ and Bailey is taken. So the next day, on August 9th, Lori places the ad to sell Bailey. I believe she put it on Facebook Marketplace. You can't do that with service dogs. These are dogs that if you can't take care of the dog, you're supposed to contact the trainer or the company that you got the dog from. It said, Bailey has such a sweet spirit. He has brought so much love to his home, but his owner recently died and he needs a new home. He is fully trained with certification as a service dog, up to date on vaccinations, had been trained with children in the home, non-smoking home. Bailey is sweet and friendly around other dogs, looking for new owners who will appreciate and love him the way he has been loved. 
spent $7,000 on service training. He is a full-bred golden doodle, has experience on airplanes, has experience with people with autism. She was asking $2,500 for Bailey. So August 9th, Kay emails Detective Moffat. We are seriously worried about JJ's safety and well-being. Is it possible for you to check his school on Monday to see if he's there? Been there and if he's okay. If he's out of his routine, he will be combative, uncooperative, etc. His teachers will know how home life is by his actions. And that is very true. I worked for two years with children and young adults with various degrees of autism. And we could always tell when things at home were not great because it spills over. Autistic kids thrive on structure and routine. And when that's broken, it causes so much trauma internally for the kids, which sometimes can come out externally with their behavior. She goes on to say, Lori hasn't responded to text or call since the text she sent about the kids getting nothing. And I got all the insurance money. We're extremely worried. We can't lose him too. Please, please, please help us. We're heartbroken. If Lori was saying, I wouldn't be worried, but she's not. She stated she didn't want him anymore in January. And now she doesn't have $1 million. She really will not want him now. Other than a measly social security check for her at $1,900 and JJ at $1,900. She's screwed unless she has a new boyfriend with deep pockets. Who knows? Please help us. Chad did not have deep pockets. So August 10th, Lori texts Chad to check on JJ. She said he woke up saying crazy stuff and wouldn't go back to sleep. She said he was talking to his evil spirit named Blake. Chad responds that JJ was still JJ and was being told that JJ's spirit recognized Blake was evil and unsettled by him. You know, Lori did not fill JJ's medication for a very long time. I fully believe at this point he was unmedicated. And I think my speculation and total just my own theory is that in not giving JJ his medicine his behavior would be affected and I think that would be her justification that something was wrong with him in in their world that her and Chad created investigators noted that in August it seemed like Lori and Chad were having a hard time carrying on their affair because Tammy was still alive and Chad was still married so interesting so on August 10th Kate and Larry see JJ on FaceTime for the very last time Kay later emails Detective Moffat and said they finally saw him on FaceTime for 36 seconds. She said it's not unusual for him to call and hang up five or ten times, but the contact with JJ has been extremely short. She said JJ is easy to manipulate and his diabolical homicidal mother knows this. She said he is always exuberant and loud, but yesterday he was subdued to say the least and that worried her and Larry. August 11th is Chad's birthday. And so what does Lori do? Manipulate, she says. In a text to Chad, you should give all your love and attention to your wife and family. I'm just a distraction. Go have fun with your family. I really want you to. I just can't be in the way anymore. If things change, we can talk, but we have nothing until things change anyway. This is total manipulation to get Chad to hurry up. If you remember, Melanie Gibb just said she really thought Tammy would be gone by the time she moved to Rexburg. Well, it's August. We're getting ready to go to Rexburg. And so all this is is a little nudge, in my opinion, to get him to hurry up and kill his wife. August 12th, Lori has a meeting with Social Security at 1.30 p.m. in Apache Junction, Arizona. The amount they told her was close to that $4,000 estimate that she got when she did the benefits estimator before Charles was even murdered. August 14th, Lori purchases glow-in-the-dark malachite titanium rings from an Etsy store for $259.98, a size 4 and a size 11 and a half. However, that money was refunded to her eventually because the owner of the company just didn't have time to make them. However, before she knows that, she sent Melanie a screenshot of those rings. Here's the thing. It's August. You're two months away from when Tammy's murdered, but yet she's buying wedding rings. And eventually, when they do get married, they're wearing Malachite rings. 
the same day she screenshots a home in Rexburg. I'm assuming it's a rental home. So you look within, you know, August 11th, his birthday is kind of the ultimatum. And then on the 14th, she's buying rings for their wedding. So I don't know what happened in between there. If they had a phone conversation where Chad said, I'm working on it or what, but things changed within those days of go be with your family to let me spend $259 on wedding rings. August 16th, Lori changes the deposit of Tylee's social security benefits from Tylee's bank account to hers. This is my theory. I think she did this at this time because she needed Tylee's signature in person because Tylee would be murdered three weeks later. So we are going to end it there. The next episode, we are going to get into the move to Rexburg. And that is when, as if things hadn't broken loose already, they really do. Because we're getting into the timeline of the kids being murdered. And it is just another sad episode coming up. I mean, this is such a sad story. And sometimes I make little jokes like with the the Chatty Potter and stuff. I'm okay making fun of Lori and Chad. They've earned that. But um, at the end of the day, this is such a devastating story in so many ways, so many lives affected. But tomorrow we're going to keep going on this. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your evening. We'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.